at, <laughs> at the University of Southern California. Uh, she received her uh, bachelor's degree in chemical engineering uh, from Florida A&M and uh, a PhD from che in chemical engineering from Northwestern. Uh, she uh, completed a postdoc, a postdoc at um, uh, Hopkins in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, she's joined the faculty in, at uh, USC in 2013, where she leads the Computational Systems Biology Lab. She holds uh, the uh, Gordon S. Marshall Early uh, Career Chair, as well as the FAM Professorship. Uh, I don't know if I've ever introduced people with two titles like that. Um, her list of honors, I'm used to going to websites or CVs and seeing bullet points. They don't even bother on her website. They're just listed so that they, uh, so they don't take up too much space. Um, and uh, as a nice segue to a little uh, addition to our, our uh, introduction today, uh, Dr. Finley is amazingly uh, active and act, sounds like her whole group is active in outreach for um, uh, STEM education, uh, reaching back as far as uh, middle school, I think. So really an, an amazing website to see the kinds of things that she's involved with. So um, that leads us into, uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Eduardo Davila, who's gonna talk a little bit about a new award uh, from the um, education office. Thank you. Uh, so Dr. Finley, welcome. I hope your visit's been uh, great so far. So as part of the, uh, you know, one of the roles that I, I have here is the Associate Director of Cancer Research and Education and Training. So, you know, your commitment to cancer research and mentoring the next generation is uh, in incredibly important to all of what we do. So we'd like to introduce to you uh, a, a new award that we just uh, have recently come up with, which is called uh, the Cancer Warrior Award. So in appreciation of everything you've done and continue to do and you visiting out here, we present to you this award. So thank you so much. Thank you. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and for this wonderful award. It's a surprise. I'm very honored to um, be the recipient of it and just happy and excited to be able to talk with you about the research that my lab is doing. Um, we are using computational modeling and we're really in the field of systems biology in order to better understand uh, tumors. Um, so today I'll talk to you about uh, two projects um, that we are pursuing in order to better understand the tumor ecosystem. A little bit of background um, and is that we are broadly situated in the field called mathematical oncology, which aims to understand the complexities of cancer using mathematical models and computational analyses. And we know that cancer is well suited for these kinds of approaches because of its complexity, because of the number of different cell types that are there, the different processes that are happening, such as angiogenesis and other processes. And so we believe that we can use mathematical modeling to better understand this uh, progression of the disease. So the goal of my lab is to predict the dynamics of networks in cancer um, to help us understand the vulnerabilities of cancer cells and other cells in the tumor microenvironment and uh, see how they can be exploited to inhibit tumor growth. And to do that, we're using systems biology. So studying the whole rather than individual parts. And we're combining mathematical modeling, which is really the expertise of my lab. And we collaborate quite closely with a number of experimental research groups to get the data that we need for building the model, and then also go back and test and validate the model predictions. We're again, we're interested in complex networks inside of cells. So this includes signaling networks, met metabolic networks, but also interactions between cells. And uh, one area of research is to look at cell-cell interactions using agent-based modeling approaches. Uh, we're still very interested in tumor angiogenesis, which is work extending from my postdoc at Hopkins. And then we're also quite interested in cancer metabolism. So what I'll do today is to tell you two short stories that all have to do with um, understanding and modeling the tumor ecosystem. The first is focused on tumor uh, cancer metabolism. The second is uh, focusing on cell-cell interactions and the effect of the tumor microenvironment. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of cancer metabolism, we're really quite interested in colorectal cancer. There are a number of reasons I don't really have to justify it so much. Uh, it's the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths among men. Uh, there's just a, about a 12 survival rate now for five years for metastatic colorectal cancer. 
And there's just a limited number of treatment options. And there is also resistance to certain standard uh, therapies that contribute to the high morbidity and mortality rates. We know that there are lots of different contributors to uh, the resistance to standard treatments, including stromal cells, such as cancer-associated fibroblasts. And there are lots of different ways, and this figure is meant to describe and show the different ways in which cancer-associated fibroblasts can influence um, tumor cells. So we can have activation of the fibroblasts, we can have um, uh, cancer cell genotype uh, driven education of the calves, we can have epigenetic reprogramming, of course the spatial organization is quite important, promoting stim stimness in cancer cells as well. And we're really focusing in on metabolic reprogramming of cancer-associated fibroblasts and this reciprocal interactions between cancer cells and calves. And what we want to do here is to try to understand how the calves are influencing the metabolism of colorectal cancer cells. And so we've partnered with Shannon Mumenthaler, who is in the School of Medicine at uh, USC, and particularly her uh, research scientist, Emma Fong, who allowed us to develop this experimental study that we can use to better understand the effects of calves on the cancer cell metabolism. So what Emma was able to do is to culture colorectal cancer cells in their normal growth medium for 24 hours and then switch them or really maintain uh, the growth medium for another 24 hours. So we're really interested in this difference between time zero and the second 24 hours of growth. And then we have a second condition that's happening in parallel where cells, after they were grown in CRC media for 24 hours, they were switched to calf condition media. And by this, I meant she separately grows calves, uh, takes the, the secreted medium uh, from the uh, calves and then uses that to grow the colorectal cancer cells. And so we have these two conditions, CRC only or CRC switched to calf condition media. We can also look at the two different time points and then we can take these samples and uh, uh, run LCMS, so mass spectrometry, in order to quantify the metabolite levels. And again, we're mainly interested in this full change of what's happening from time zero when either the, the um, media is replenished or when the media is switched to calf condition media. And that's with uh, collaboration with Nick Graham, who's in chemical engineering at USC. And then we take the data from the mass spec measurements and use those in mathematical modeling. And this is driven by a postdoc uh, formerly in my lab, Dr. Junmin Wang, where we can now model the and predict the fluxes that are going through metabolic pathways. So the question that we want to answer is what are the effects of calf condition media on colorectal cancer cell metabolism? So the first thing that we said, well, let's just look at morphologically if there are any differences or if there are changes in the growth rate due to the calf condition media. And so I, I already described to you that we have these two conditions, CRC only media or CRC that were switched to calf condition media. We also have uh, cells in the DLD1 uh, colorectal cancer cell line that have wild type KRAS or that have a mutant KRAS. So we can look at genotype uh, changes and then also the effects of the growth media. So looking across the row, we can see that when cells are switched to calf condition media, there are morphological changes. So they're switching from this rounder phenotype to a more philopodia uh, elongated phenotype. We certainly see that both in the case for wild type KRAS and for KRAS mutant cells. Um, but what we don't see are any changes in growth rate. So I've colored the squares around these four different conditions and these colors will uh, appear in subsequent slides where we can see that if the cells are grown in CRC only media or switch to calf condition media, so going from a light blue to a dark blue or from a light green to a dark green, we really don't see any differences in the growth rate. So this tells us that it's not something at the macroscopic level that we can appreciate other than these uh, morphological changes. And maybe we should look at what's happening inside the cells uh, to give us more insight into the effects that the calves are having on colorectal cancer cells. So what we did is to first look at just the raw data from the mass spectrometry to compare the effect of the growth media and then also to compare the effect of the KRAS mutation. So what I'm showing are the uh, relative metabolite levels when we look at cells that were uh, maintained in CRC only media compared to cells that were switched to calf condition media. 
This is just for wild type cells. And you can see um, in red are the cells or the metabolites that have differential expression for these two different conditions due to the switch to the calf condition media. So there are about 20 different metabolites that have differential uh, abundance levels. And I've just um, labeled those that are in central carbon metabolism. So glycolysis, pentose phosphate pathway, or TCA cycle. We can see very similar results when we have the cells that have the KRAS mutant. Um, and so still about 18 um, metabolites that have differential expression levels, but just one that's specifically in uh, glycolysis and specifically in uh, uh, central carbon metabolism. So this is quite different. Uh, when we compare the effect of just the uh, wild type versus KRAS. So you see very few, much, many of less, much less number of metabolites that have a differential expression level. Um, when we have either cells that were um, maintained in CRC only media or switched to calf condition media, when we're just comparing the effect of the KRAS mutation. And so this is telling us that it's really the effect of the growth media that's having a stronger influence on the metabolite levels compared to their genotype. So we said, well, let's look in, in more detail. What are those metabolites that are changing and how are they changing? Are they increasing or decreasing uh, due to the presence of the calf condition media? So again, this color scheme is going to come up uh, on several more slides, but we're just looking at the effect of CRC only um, media when we have these lighter colors, either light green or light blue. And then the darker colors can, are related to CRC switch to calf condition media. And so what I'm showing is just the level of the metabolite. Uh, this is specifically uh, G6P, just that first metabolite in glycolysis. We can see how its relative full change is when we have it only present in CRC only media or when it's switched to calf condition media. This is just for wild type cells. And so you're gonna see this bar, uh, this gray line going across because we're always interested in the effects relative to cells that were grown, wild type cells that were grown in CRC only media. Okay, so we can do this for all the other metabolites in glycolysis and pentose phosphate pathway and the TCA cycle that we're able to quantify and measure with mass spectrometry. And what you should take away is that there's really no um, over, overarching um, trend, right? So there's not the case where all of the glycolytic metabolites are increasing or decreasing, no trend for TCA cycle or pentose phosphate pathway. We see this same lack of trend when we look at the cells that have the KRAS mutant. So it's not just enough to look at individual metabolites, but really, really we need to look at this from more of a systems level perspective. We know that the metabolites are um, converted and uh, broken down and built back up in different ways through metabolic pathways. And so we need to look at this from the pathway perspective rather than just at individual metabolite level. So that's exactly what we did with our mathematical modeling. So we're using constraint-based modeling to allow us to predict the fluxes through the reactions in these uh, central carbon pathways. So what we can do is first to provide some constraints, right? So this is flux balance modeling. We need to first um, initialize the metabolite levels, which we take from literature. We need to use the experimental data that we quantified from the mass spectrometry measurement. So this is the full changes over 24 hours. These allow us to specify some mass balance constraints. We add to this bounds on the fluxes. So an upper and lower bound for all of the fluxes, whether they're reversible or irreversible. And then we also take bounds that we measured experimentally for the nutrient uptake and secretion rates. So we were able to measure glucose uptake, glutamine uptake, and also lactate secretion. And we provide these as bounds on those fluxes for those uh, transporter reactions. So all of this provides bounds for the mass balances. And then we perform what's called unsteady state parsimonious flux balance analysis. And what we're doing here is also accounting for the measured growth rate uh, from the different four different uh, experimental conditions. And it constrains one reaction flux in our model, which is predicting the rate of biomass production. So this is meant to um, represent the growth of the cells. And since we've measured the growth, we can further constrain the model. Now we have all these constraints and what we want to do is ultimately predict the fluxes through each of the reactions. And I can go through in a lot of detail and talk about the um, 
the methodology and the approach. The parsimonious uh, flux balance analysis just means that we're assuming that given this measured growth rate, we want to minimize the sum of all the fluxes in our network, assuming that the cell is trying to be as energetically efficient as possible, given this growth rate that it's trying to meet. And then we can perform this mass balance analysis. It is um, an iterative approach that we can ultimately get the fluxes through all the reactions. Happy to talk more about the methodology and we really were inspired and adapted it from uh, this paper by Boardbar uh, from scientific reports. But what we get out of it are the fluxes through all of the reactions in central carbon metabolism. So let's talk about those, again, looking at it from a pathway perspective. So this is glycolysis, it's linear we know, but I've shown it in this way so that you can see we have glucose uptake, lactate, lactate secretion, and we can predict the flux through each reaction in this pathway. So again, I'm going to show the flux through hexokinase reaction, just this first reaction in the pathway, um, relative to the case where we have wild type cells that were only grown in CRC only media. And then we can see how the uh, presence of calf conditioned media changes the flux through those reactions. So we can see clearly that there's an increase in the flux through hexokinase due to the presence of the calf conditioned media. We see this across, it's very consistent across all of the uh, reactions in glycolysis, um, all the way down to uh, the lactose, lactate dehydrogenase reaction. I'm just outlining in red these two uh, fluxes for GLUT, so that's glucose uptake and MCT, which is lactate secretion, because these are not predictions from the model. These are uh, constraints that we included in the model because they were measured experimentally. But across all of these, we see that the presence of the calf condition media leads to an increase in the flux through these glycolytic reactions. This is true for wild type cells, also for cells with the KRAS mutant, very clear increases in the flux through these glycolytic reactions. So the presence of calf condition media is um, altering the cancer cells metabolism so that they're more reliant on glycolysis. Let's see what's happening in the pentose phosphate pathways. We see similar increases in the fluxes through the oxidative arm of the pentose phosphate pathway due to the presence of the calf condition media, both for wild type cells and for cells that were uh, having the KRAS mutation. This is different uh, for non-oxidative arm of pentose phosphate pathway. So we're seeing that the cells are able to um, separate out or really um, uh, uh, have a difference between oxidative and non-oxidative arm due to the presence of the calf condition media. For wild type cells, there's really no difference or effect of calf condition media, but for cells with the KRAS mutation, we see that there's actually a decrease in the uh, flux through the oxi non-oxidative arm of pentose phosphate pathway. So they're able to decouple these two arms of pentose phosphate pathway, presumably to uh, be able to produce the nucleotides uh, needed for uh, synthesis perhaps of, of other cells or just the mm, metabolic energetic uh, ability to uh, continue to uh, have the growth rates that we measured experimentally. And then finally, we can look at TCA cycle and glutaminolysis. So this is the metabolism of glutamine and we see some interesting uh, effects of the calf condition media. So we see actually that TCA cycle reaction fluxes are decreased due to the presence of the calf condition media. So there's actually a down regulation of fluxes through TCA cycle when the cells are switched to calf condition media. This is for wild type cells. We see very similar results for the case of uh, the KRAS mutation. And I didn't mention it on the previous slides, but this asterisk just means that there is a statistically significant difference between the light bars and the dark bars. And I should also mention that the reason we have error bars for these mathematical modeling predictions is that we're running the model uh, 100 different times with different starting initial concentrations of the metabolites because we haven't been able to either find in literature or measure ourselves the absolute concentrations of these metabolites. So we sample from a range and run our model 100 times in order to get the range of predictions for the fluxes through uh, these reactions. 
So TCA cycle reaction fluxes are decreased due to the presence of the calf condition media. And then actually for glutaminolysis, we see some interesting things happening because first of all, just the presence of calf condition media is increasing the uptake of glutamine. So again, this is uh, outlined in red because that's what we measured experimentally, the AC, uh, ASCT2 reaction that in both KRAS mutant cells and wild type cells, the cells are taking up more glutamine due to the presence of the calf condition media. Now, that means that also is affecting the way that the cells are using that glutamine or trying to produce more glutamine in the absence of a higher uptake rate. So we can see a very clear difference in this glutamine synthase reaction, where cells that were switched to calf condition media, which are the dark bars, have a high flux through that reaction. And uh, so that reaction is converting glutamine to glutamate. So that's going in this direction. And uh, the cells that um, do not have, uh, have not been switched to calf condition media have very little flux, if any at all, going through that reaction. Instead, they're using the glutamine synthase reaction, which is going in this glutamate, glutamine synthase reaction, which is going in this direction to produce from glutamate more glutamine to alter or you know, counterbalance the um, lack of uptake of uh, more glutamine due to the presence of calf condition media. So this very detailed you know, high resolution model that looks at the fluxes through each of these reactions help us, helps us to understand the effect of calf condition media, the reprogramming that's happening and the subsequent downstream effects um, that uh, the cells are trying to um, uh, you know, efficiently utilize the metabolites that they have at hand. So just to summarize, right, for wild type and for KRAS mutant cells, we see that the presence of calf condition media increases glycolysis, increases the oxidative arm of pentose phosphate pathway, increases glutaminolysis, and decreases TCA cycle reactions. Just in the case of, of uh, KRAS mutant cells, do we also see a decrease in the non-oxidative arm of pentose phosphate pathway. So this gives us some clues as to maybe how we can exploit the effect of the calf condition media um, in saying, well, if the cells are more uh, reliant on glycolysis or more reliant on oxidative uh, pentose phosphate pathway reactions, can we target those reactions in order to reduce the growth of the tumor cells? And so that's what we did next in our simulations is to uh, simulate a gene deletion to say, for example, let's turn off the PFK reaction. So that means in our model, we're saying that there's no flux that can go through that reaction. We're changing the bounds on that reaction to say no flux can go through this reaction and then predict the maximal possible growth rate. So we're trying to say in the context of this gene deletion or this enzyme knockout, how much can the cells grow? And are there any differences in cells that were in the maximal predicted growth rate for cells that were maintained in CRC only media or cells that were switched to calf condition media? So I'll show you these results um, just to sort of orient you to what I'm plotting here. We're looking at uh, the flux or the maximal growth rate for cells that were switched to calf condition media. That's on the uh, vertical axis and cells that were maintained in CRC only media is on the horizontal axis. In any case, that's just along the 45 degree angle line. That means that there's no difference between those cells or so no effect of the calf condition media in the maximally predicted growth rate. And so I'm showing in gray all of these different knockouts that we can do just systematically turning off each of those reactions. And in red, those are the ones that there is a significant difference between cells that were switched to calf condition media compared to CRC only media. And so then you can see if we're just looking at the, the points that are below the 45 degree angle line, this, these indicate the knockouts where the cells that were switched to calf condition media are more vulnerable to those knockouts. So we see some things that make sense, right? Um, reducing the amount of glucose that can be taken up reducing hexokinase reaction, reducing reactions in glycolysis, and also um, the oxidative arm of pentose phosphate pathway. So again, we got some clues as to what to expect based on the predictions of the fluxes, but now we can go a step further and say, well, what's the maximum growth rate that we would have if we were to knock out those reactions? This is the case for uh, wild type cells. <clears throat> And we can see very similar results for cells that have the KRAS mutant. So one thing is that there are fewer cell, uh, fewer knockouts that are having an effect 
um, in this case when we have the KRAS mutant. So that's also not unexpected. We know that this um, mutation would make the um, cells more robust to uh, alterations, but we still see that the cells are um, uh, vulnerable to knockouts in glycolysis and pentose phosphate pathway, the oxidative arm, because they are relying more on those uh, to meet the growth demands and to meet the energetic demands of the cells. So what I have shown to you in this first part of the talk is that we can see the effect of the cap condition media. It's stronger in terms of altering central carbon metabolism than the KRAS mutation. We can also identify gene deletions or enzyme knockouts that would specifically affect the cells that were switched to calf condition media. So we can see how the change in media is um, making the cells more vulnerable to these metabolic alterations. And I didn't have time or want to talk about it so much today, but we can also predict um, the uh, rate of inter the production of different energetic substrates, NADP NADH, NADPH, and then also AD uh, ATP. And um, so altogether, we are having this framework that allows us to understand the metabolic reprogramming due to the presence of calf condition media. So it's not exactly this uh, physical interaction, right? It's through the calf condition media, but it helps us to understand the ways in which the calves are altering the metabolism of colorectal cancer cells. So we've just honed in on this first part, metabolic reprogramming of um, the ca cancer cells due to the presence of calves. So what we are trying to do next is to validate those predictions about the vulnerabilities due to the presence of calf condition media. I've only talked about the effects in one direction. So calves affecting colorectal cancer cells. We're also looking at how colorectal cancer cell condition media affects the calf. So we can look at the reciprocal interactions. And then really where we're going is to try to embed this detailed model of the fluxes inside of an agent-based model that now allows us to simulate the growth and spatial organization of colorectal cancer cells and of calves and how together um, at the population level, metabolize, metabolism is driving cell behavior. With that, then we can try to predict how targeting the metabolism in one cell type or another would influence growth of the whole population. And we can validate that using um, 3D patient-derived tumor organoids. So that's sort of the whole of lifespan of the project. We're still just in these first two um, bullet points. We actually have already uh, made the handshake between the detailed uh, flux balance model that I described to you today into PhysiCell, which is a collaboration with Paul Macklin at Indiana University. And then we're still collaborating with Shannon to be able to validate the predictions using this 3D organoid. It's actually really cool. I, I, I won't be able to tell you today, but it's really cool that we can uh, use this 2D um, developed model of metabolism, put it into PhysiCell, and at the 3D level, uh, with this agent-based approach, it matches the growth rates without us having to um, set the growth rates in the, the 3D agent-based model. So we're already making that handshake, and we feel that we're going to develop a, a pipeline and a, a platform that allows us to understand how we can target intracellular metabolism and affect the population level dynamics. So yes, this is to, to show integration of the um, intracellular metabolism model with PhysiCell and using the patient-derived uh, tumor organoids to validate the model predictions. So we're really quite excited about this. The work that I presented today is uh, published earlier this year um, in metabolic engineering, and we're still marching forward in uh, moving towards uh, seeing how we can target intracellular metabolism and influence population dynamics. So I told you this short vignette about cancer metabolism. I'm going to switch gears and talk about a different aspect of the tumor ecosystem. And this is looking at cell-cell interactions and competition, but also the effect of the microenvironment. So we know, right, that there are lots of cell types that are present in the tumor microenvironment. They interact with one another in different ways, right, with tumor immune interactions, so T-cell mediated tumor cell death immune cell interactions. So for example, um, the presence of macrophages can influence T cell activation and vice versa. And then tumor immune, tumor stromal interactions where tumor cells can secrete uh, proangiogenic factors such as vascular endothelial growth factor and influence other stromal cells like endothelial cells to promote new blood vessel formation. 
And so we're quite interested in the interactions between cells in this ecosystem. Um, and we're trying to develop both mechanistic and data-driven modeling approaches to study the intracellular signaling, how that gives rise to the population dynamics, and then use that platform to explore different treatment strategies. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about modeling the tumor ecosystem. This is work from a very talented um, senior graduate student in the lab, Colin Sess. He first started looking at the effect of macrophage-based therapies with our first agent-based model to look at how T-cell mediated tumor cell killing is influenced by M2 macrophages and M1 macrophages. So this interaction between this, these different subsets of immune cells and tumor, tumor cells as well. And then he moved on and said, well, let's just focus in on tumor cells and see how their phenotype uh, evolves over time in response to the local microenvironment and in response to interactions between tumor cells. And so this is what I'll talk to you about uh, for the next few minutes. So we try to uh, account for the tumor microenvironment. We said that um, there can be the increase of hypoxia, so low levels of, action, of oxygen. That actually leads uh, tumor cells to have increased glycolysis, increased migratory ability, and uh, hypoxia can be allevi alleviated by the presence of, or the growth of new blood vessels, so angiogenesis, to inhibit hypoxia. Angiogenesis can also inhibit uh, acidity, so low pH levels, but when tumor cells are present in um, low pH levels for long periods of time, then they can um, develop this resistance to low pH levels and still thrive and grow um, even in the uh, presence or even in the environment of having low pH. And so we wanted to look at this evolution from a base phenotype to cells that have increased acid resist resistance, increased glycolysis, and increased migratory ability in response to the local tumor microenvironment and in response to interactions between tumor cells. So we're using a very different modeling approach. It's called agent-based models, where we can look at individual agents or cells that are autonomous, right? They have certain rules that uh, define or determine their behavior. And we can look at how many cells there are over time and also the spatial distribution of cells. So let me talk a little bit about this modeling framework. We again have the evolution into cells that have higher acid resistance, higher glycolysis or higher migratory ability in response to those tumor microenvironmental conditions. But then the cells also can perform different activities. So they can proliferate, they can migrate, they can die via necrosis, necrosis, and then metabolize nutrients. So I just wanna pause quickly here and say, it's not the very detailed metabolic network that I just described to you because we're on a different scale. We're just looking at how cells can take up oxygen and glucose and use that to produce a hydrogen atom that's representing um, lactic acid. And that's the uh, increase in the acidity uh, in the tumor microenvironment. So a little bit more about the framework. Um, this is an off-lattice, center-based, agent-based model. So it means that every cell is represented by a point and a radius. So we know where the cell is. We know where it is in relation to other cells in the tumor microenvironment. Cells exert forces on one another and the surrounding tissue exerts forces on the cells themselves. So this is um, a discrete model, right? We just know where the cells are and how many there are. It's paired with a continuous model where we're also looking at um, how much of these diffusible factors are present where are they located and what is their concentration? And these diffusible con uh, factors, their concentration is described by partial differential equations or PDEs. This includes metabolic species, oxygen, glucose, the hydrogen ion, um, angiogenic factors like VEGF that influence um, uh, angiogenesis and the formation of new blood vessels. And I'll talk a little bit more also about this chemotherapeutic agent that we're also simulating the effects of. So we include tumor vasculature, but it's very simple. We're not interested in like the 3D vessel network or you know, hydrodynamic flow through the, through the blood vessels. We're really just saying there's a point source. This is a blood vessel. It's a source for oxygen and glucose, and it takes away lactic acid. 
Um, the blood vessels have a health characteristic. So when blood vessels appear, they have this base health characteristic, and that is reduced as more tumor cells are um, proliferating and growing around the, the blood vessel because we know that tumor cells can exert some uh, pressure on blood vessels and that renders the blood vessels, um, since they're compressible, it can render the blood vessel um, ineffective in providing oxygen and glucose. And then we also account for the host tissue, just to say that it um, provides some competition for uh, the nutrients, which they can also take up and compete for nutrients compared to the tumor cells. So we're simulating two uh, drug treatments. One is anti-angiogenic treatment. So this is decreasing vessel recruitment, increasing vessel health. And then chemotherapy is inducing drug damage. And we're looking at angio anti-angiogenic treatment alone or in combination with chemotherapy because we can compare to uh, preclinical studies and even clinical studies to see how does that affect the uh, cancer cell behavior. So with this kind of model, we can answer different kinds of questions. So first of all, what are the dynamics of tumor growth? How many cells do we have over time? How does that evolve? But then also we can look at individual cells, individual agents, and see how are their states evolving over time and in response to treatment. So let me just talk first about the evolution and of the tumor growth and the cell states without any treatment at all. And what we did here is to vary different properties of the tumor cells and specifically properties of the vessels. So we said maybe the tumor cells have a low rate of vessel recruitment and the vessels, when they are recruited, they have a low health. How does that influence the spatial organization of the, of the tumor and also just the number of cells that are present? So what I'm showing here is just a snapshot from our agent-based model after a simulated time of 200 days, where we start with just 25 cells and then let the cell population evolve over time, not just in number, but also in their cell states. And so the um, gray here, the gray circles indicate the tumor cells that are in the base state. So base level of glycolysis, base level of acid resistance and base level of migratory ability. The black uh, indicates necrotic cells. Uh, the red dots are the blood vessels, the point sources. And then we can see the purple, blue, or yellow indicates cells that have evolved from that base state into either having higher migratory ability, higher acid resistance, or higher glycolysis, or all three together, right? So you can see, for example, this collection of cells here is high, has more glycolysis, higher resistance to acid, and more migratory ability. So we can compare the um, you know, spatial distribution and the sizes of the predicted tumors when we vary the rate of uh, recruitment of blood vessels and the rate of, or the level of the blood vessel health. So when we have still low recruitment rate, but the vessels that are recruited have higher health, we see a different morphology of the tumor. Right, so there's not this breakthrough of the surround into the much breakthrough into the surrounding tumor uh, or uh, uh, tissue, the surrounding tissue around the tumor. Um, the amount of necrosis is a little bit more limited and con uh, constrained in the center, and then we don't have as many of these cells that have evolved at least to have a migra higher migratory ability. Still, the cells have a uh, high acid resistance, and we may have a fewer fewer number of cells with higher glycolysis. So we're really just trying to understand how are the um, microenvironmental conditions and the um, rates at which the tumor um, vessels, blood vessels, are recruited, how does that influence the distribution and the spatial organization of the tumor cells, as well as their cell states. Now we see some very different results when we have high rate of recruitment of the blood vessels, whether there's low health or high health of the blood vessels. So in this case, the tumor is much more contained. There's not this breakthrough into the surrounding, uh, surrounding uh, tissue. And we see that the cells that have evolved to have higher acid resistance or higher migratory ability are really constrained and held within the center of the tumor. So just changing the rate of blood vessel recruitment has a strong impact on the spatial organization of the tumor. This is, these are all predicted results. Now we say, what happens when we add anti-angiogenic treatment, which again, reduces the rate of recruitment and allows the cells that are, are recruited 
to, or sorry, it increases the rate of, uh, sorry, decreases the rate of recruitment of the blood vessels, but the cells that are recruited have higher health. So it's been shown that maybe antiangiogenic treatment does something called vessel normalization, which allows the blood vessels to be more um, like normal blood vessels instead of those that are compressed and leaky and um, uh, torturous. And so we can say when we have antiangiogenic treatment, how does that change the distribution of the cells and the evolution of the cell states um, compared to this case where there's no treatment at all? So now I'm only showing a case where we have high vessel recruitment rate and low vessel health. And then we can see compared to control, adding antiangiogenic treatment <clears throat> actually has this uh, counterintuitive effect of leading to more um, dispersion and more invasion into the surrounding base, uh, the surrounding uh, 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 tissue. So maybe one thing just to compare from left to right is that on the right-hand side with the antiangiogenic treatment, we certainly have more dead cells, right? You see more black cells here. So definitely the treatment is having the effect of reducing the number of viable cancer cells, but the cells that are remaining have higher migratory ability, they're more resistant to low pH levels, and they're relying more heavily on glycolysis. So this has also been shown in preclinical studies as well that adding antiangiogenic therapy actually leads the cells to be more migratory, more invasive. And so certainly we're seeing that in the mathematical modeling predictions as well. So definitely reducing the number of viable tumor cells, but the cells that are remaining are more aggressive, more migratory and they're spreading further away from the tumor center. And we can see that if we look at, right, if we run this same simulation out to 200 days for um, 100 times or even 1,000 times, we can get a distribution to know how many cells are present at a certain distance from the tumor center. And then the case where there's no uh, treatment at all, so that's shown in black, uh, compared to the case with antiangiogenic treatment, we see a clear shift of having more cells, so higher frequency of cells, a further distance away from the center of the tumor. So just a more quantitative way to describe what we see qualitatively in terms of this dispersion and invasion of the tumor cells. Then we said, well, let's add antiangiogenic treatment combined with chemotherapy. We can also account for an increase in resistance to chemotherapy because we know that tumor cells are acquiring or um, developing this resistance to chemotherapeutic agents. And we can look at now just the number of cancer cells that are present as a function of time. So in all of the cases, we allow the tumor to reach um, approximately one cubic, um, or sorry, yeah, one cubic millimeter in uh, volume. And then we can add the uh, antiangiogenic treatment um, or combined with chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is shown in blue alone and chemotherapy combined with chemo with antiangiogenic therapy is shown in red. So first of all, we see that even going from uh, left to right, when we have increase in resistance to chemotherapy, that the addition of antiangiogenic therapy can slow down the regrowth after this uh, decrease due to the presence of the, the treatment compared to chemotherapy alone. So there's this decrease in number of tumor cells, but a rapid regrowth, particularly when we have increased resistance to chemotherapy. And the base level of resistance or no resistance at all, then there's really no effect of adding in the antiangiogenic therapy. So what we found is that it slows regrowth. It makes the cells less glycolytic. I didn't show that here. Um, less migratory, but actually it increases the resistance to acidity. So there's this, um, you know, antagonistic effect of having the antiangiogenic therapy present with the chemotherapy as well. And then maybe one just uh, last figure to show some results is now looking at the spatial distribution. And here I'm only going to show the um, state that corresponds to uh, changes in the migratory ability. So compared to chemotherapy alone, adding antiangiogenic therapy um, doesn't have too much effect when we're just changing or having a low uh, resistance to chemotherapy. We see these uh, pockets of cells where there are um, cells that are in still the base phenotype, so that's shown in gray, that are surrounded by um, a, a layer of necrotic cells. And we see these um, other sort of uh, pockets of cells that are present all around. And when we add antiangiogenic therapy, it may even increase uh, this, um, you know, 
separation of the cell populations. But as we increase the resistance to chemotherapy, then we still, and add antiangiogenic therapy as well, we still see this invasion into the surrounding tissue. We still see the cells having even more migratory ability um, compared to chemotherapy alone, where we might have a smaller, more contained tumor, um, more tumor cells here compared to, in this case, where there are a lot of uh, necrotic cells, but those um, higher, those cells with higher migratory ability are really constrained and um, held within the center of the tumor. So this antiangiogenic therapy, while it does have the effect of reducing the number of viable cancer cells, it's making the cells more migratory. And we certainly see that invasion into the surrounding tissues. And we can also, again, run this simulation many times and get the distribution of cells um, and compare where they're located uh, relative to the center of the tumor. And we see that when we have um, chemotherapy alone compared to antiangiogenic therapy alone, where we clearly see this shift towards uh, having more cells at the center, uh, 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 away from the center of the tumor compared to the combination. So we see this sort of intermediate effect when we combine chemotherapy and antiangiogenic therapy, but still the cells are highly um, migratory as well. So just to summarize here, um, I've de developed and pre presented to you a different kind of model that allows us to look at individual cell states, how they're evolving over time in response to the local microenvironment and in response to treatment. We can see that antiangiogenic treatment shifts the cells to be more glycolytic, have higher invas invasiveness and um, more resistance to low pH levels. And then combining antiangiogenic treatment along with chemotherapy reduces that harsh microenvironment of having the low pH level and high uh, hypoxia. And so the cells have less pressure to adapt. They're more contained in the center of the tumor, um, but it's still uh, you know, different than just having chemotherapy alone. So we can use this kind of model, again, to look at the distribution of cells, which we didn't get or we don't get from just ordinary differential equation models. And then we can see how the cell's phenotypes are evolving over time. So what's next in this context? So we're really interested in sort of building up this multi-scale modeling approach, incorporating um, intracellular networks, whether they're metabolism networks or signaling networks or gene regulatory networks that we can infer, for example, from a single cell trans transcriptomics data so that the behaviors of the cells are not just based on these phenomenological rules, but they're based on the intracellular program that defines the uh, cellular decisions. Um, we're still very interested in validating the model predictions to uh, tumor -derived, patient derived tumor organoids in order to test and, and, and validate the model predictions. And then something that we're really excited about is using multiplexed imaging um, in order to calibrate the parameters from our agent-based model. So I'm just gonna have one additional slide here, which is um, this paper that we put on, bio, uh, on archive a couple of months ago, where when we have agent-based models, they're much more difficult to calibrate and do parameter estimation compared to equation-based models, right? When you have equations, you can clearly um, vary parameters. There's very well-established approaches for doing parameter estimation and parameter sensitivity analysis. But when you have agent-based models, it's not as well-developed in terms of those approaches. And so what my student wanted to do is to basically have this um, dimensionality reduction to take the model simulation, including number of cells over time, including the spatial distribution of cells, and just um, project it into this low dimensional space. Do the same for an image that we get from our collaborator that has um, multiplex imaging to identify where the tumor cells are, where the immune cells are, or stromal cells are as well use a Siamese neural network that we can do uh, to do this um, dimensionality reduction and then project them into maybe 2D space. And now we have a, a discrete uh, value that describes the tumor image and a discrete value that describes the model simulation. And now we can take advantage of well-developed uh, approaches for performing parameter estimation. So the distance between these two points in this low dimensional space is now our objective function that we want to minimize the distance between them and do that by varying the parameters in our agent-based model. So just uh, an example that this actually works. 
um, with um, an image that we get from a, a simple um, 2D in vitro system that's just measuring whether cells are dead or alive. We can have the density of, of dead or alive cells. We can um, do um, image processing to get it into a format that we can compare really nicely with our uh, agent-based model. And this is the best fit that we get. And you can clearly see that when we start um, in our fitting steps, we have high error or high distance between the image and the model simulations, and it eventually, eventually settles down and we have a nice fit that we can now say we can alter or optimize the parameter values from our agent-based model in order to match the uh, data that we get from uh, multiplex imaging. So this is literally hot off the presses. We're hoping to submit in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're still getting more feedback and trying to see are there other ways that we can refine this approach. So with that, I will thank the members of my lab. I presented work from Colin, from Patrick and Nikki, and also from Dr. Wong, who was uh, previously a postdoc in the lab. Uh, great collaborators, funding sources, and I thank all of you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. What questions do we have? There's some in the chat for me. Yeah, I see one question I can ask after this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was really exciting work. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. So I, I'm wondering, uh, in the first model you showed, you did the interactions between uh, condition media for fibroblasts. How long last in part of the effect mm. of the cell? And can you modify the modeling to incorporate timing in the effects? Right. So. <laughs> Yes, yes. So the question is, um, what is the time scale over which the CAFs are having their effect on cancer cell metabolism? And are we uh, able to account with them, account for those uh, uh, that time dependent uh, effect with the mathematical model? So the second question first which is yes, with the model, with the uh, flux balance model, it is a dynamic model. So that's why I didn't talk about it very much, but it's unsteady state parsimonious FBA. So FBA flux balance analysis is usually done or performed at steady state, assuming that the metabolite levels aren't changing and we're just trying to see given this um, metabolite level presence, um, what are the fluxes through the reaction? And here we're doing unsteady state flux balance analysis, which is where we're comparing the full change uh, from time zero to time 24 hours. So what that means is that when we first say, okay, here's the initial concentration of a metabolite, let's say that from the mass spec data, we find that its metabolite level increases by twofold. So then with the, with the um, flux balance model, we're saying it goes from maybe two micromolar up to four micromolar. So we are counting for that dynamic change. We only have those two time points. If we were to able to, if we were able to get additional time points, we could further see now from 24 hours to 48 hours, what's the flux or more um, smaller time intervals from zero to 24. So that's something that we're absolutely interested in because we know that metabolic reprogramming is dynamic and it's not just gonna be one change and that's it, but we should look at maybe shorter time points and also longer time points, which we haven't done yet. So that's the answer to your first question, which we don't actually know how long lasting are the effects of CAFs on colorectal cancer cells. We only have this zero and 24 hour time point um, but we're interested in projecting out maybe with the mathematical model to say, what, what do we think might happen over the next 24 hours? And can we go back and validate that experimentally? The other thing that's interesting is looking in the, the reverse direction. So actually for the effect of colorectal cancer cells on calves, because calves grow much more slowly than CRC cells, we have to change the time scale that we're looking at altogether. So actually in that case, we're extending out to 72 hours so that we can see some, we can try to see something happening uh, to the calves. So this, this dynamic um, effect is quite interesting and we're trying to uh, look at it more with the modeling as well. 
<coughs> so I can like to talk about the issue. Um, in the first part, you had showed four panels in that proxy and then said that the time media panels they look longer. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you tried to quantify that mm -hmm. and maybe add some of those parameters to your model. Um, I guess one of the media thoughts there is Mm. Right. Yes. So the question is, um, we see the morphological changes when you go from CRC only media to cap condition media, namely that they're more elongated, have these filipolia like structures. Um, are we able to incorporate some aspect of that into the model? And then how do we know which is driving which, right? Changes in metabolism driving the morphology or vice versa. Um, so we haven't thought so much about, I haven't thought so much about how to incorporate morphology as a feature into the flux balance approach, um, right? Because it's looking at the reaction level response and fluxes through those reactions. Um, I don't know if maybe some, and we can't, rule out that some of the differences that we see in higher glycolysis or lower TCA cycle reaction fluxes is just due to the presence of the calves um, alone and independent totally of the uh, morphological changes. I'm wondering, maybe I would have to talk to Shannon about how we could inhibit the changes in morphology or, or maybe, maybe change the um, growth substrate or like the, the the, the growth effects that we might be able to see in terms of maybe differences in, I don't know, the seeding density or something that we might be able to say, okay, let's rule out the changes in morphology. We haven't thought about that very much, but it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Thank you. You want me to ask a question that's in the chat? Or I, one, I think maybe just one more question. Yeah, okay. just because we have people here. Let's see we'll work up to the Okay. okay. Uh, really interesting talk. Um, so just to clarify, the regulatory shift in the modeling is the cancer cell itself, correct? Have you flipped that in your modeling? So there's, you know, this whole Warburg effect and all the regulatory shift, it is potentially not actually the cancer cells itself. It's the immune cells that are like living, and they're actually feeding the cancer with lactate. Um, so first, have you tried kind of changing that model to see if how that affects and then second, um, the understanding of particularly myeloid cells is really changing a lot since so the immune tumor models where it had more of those stem tubes kind of going out the door, right? I agree. So are you planning or or using some of these more like advanced sickle cell holomix spins into your pipeline to account for that? Yes. So first question is whether we have, um, so your question was whether we have accounted for other cell types and their reliance on glycolysis and not just cancer cells. So with this model, no, we have not. This model only includes tumor cells and we're seeing their evolution and we're not, we're only seeing their effects in terms of like competition between cells and the effect of the local microenvironment and not other cell types influencing cancer cells. The second question about, yes, um, accounting for other uh, cell populations such as macrophages and not just having this like M1, M2, but actually it's a grayscale, right? It's not, it's a, it's a, it's a, it goes across the, the scale and not just these two buckets. So that's exactly what we want to be able to do by using the tumor, um, the, the tumor multiplex imaging data to say, oh, well, these are markers of macrophages or other myeloid-derived de myeloid cells, T cells as well. And we can um, look at not just whether they're present, but then also lay on top of that single cell transcriptomics data to say, okay, this is defining, right? This is the uh, expression profile that's defining the cell state. Maybe you have been in my computer and are seeing the proposals that we're writing right now because that's exactly where we're going, right? So this, I described to you like a way in which we're trying to develop a framework to be able to look at individual cells and how they interact with one another and how they are affected by the tumor microenvironment. Certainly we know it's not just a population of tumor cells. And so we're adding in, in a stepwise manner, other cell types that we know are influencing not just 
these um, you know, phenotypic states that we've defined here, but also the um, metabolic states and uh, other aspects of cell-cell interactions. We're really interested in cancer-associated fibroblasts, tumor cells, and macrophages, and the whole range of macrophage uh, phenotypes that we can define using single, scale, single cell transcriptomics data. So we want to be able to develop a platform that is data-driven, right, that includes these different cell populations that then we have a more realistic and not fully comprehensive, but more representative uh, platform to predict the tumors. I'm super interested in this, and that's exactly what we're doing. And I think the other thing too is like, most models are not taking advantage of all of these single cell data sets that are available, right? To not just say what cells are there, but in what states they are. And I'm really interested in incorporating that into our agent-based model because it's a, it's a gap in, in the modeling field. And it allows us then to make sure that the models are grounded in, in experimental data. Come work for me. If you want to, <laughs> I can learn so much from you and yeah, but no, that's exactly where we're going for sure. Let's thank Dr. Okay.